Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, How to Get the Right Postdoc Position. I'm Susie Valdez of Labyrinth, and I will be your moderator for today's event. So let's get started. I want to remind everyone that this event is interactive and that we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. And if you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, simply click on the support tab found at the top right part of your presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the ask a question box located at the bottom right of your screen. I'm going to start by introducing our first speaker today, Annalisa Franz. Professor of the Department of Chemistry at the University of California, Davis, and she's also the faculty director at the Undergraduate Research Center. And Elisa will be focusing on part one of this presentation, finding and building your mentor, mentoring team. And Elisa, welcome. You may now begin your presentation. Thank you, Susie, for the introduction, and thank you to Anne, Carrie, and all the members of the foundation. It is an honor to be speaking here today. Um, I very much enjoyed Steve, David, and Jess' talk earlier, and I know Kent's talk will be a great second part um, to this one. So when thinking about getting the right postdoc, I wanted to really weave in an overall concept, not only of the postdoc, post but of finding and building your mentoring team. So this is, I think, really important, and this is designed certainly for those who are going to be getting postdocs, but also those of you who are mentoring students and thinking about mentoring in the future as well for your independent careers. Now, there is a lot of mentoring advice out there. Um, so a Google search, image search for mentoring shows some very nice images, and we can see that there are aspects of mentoring that are quite important. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about this, but I really wanna start a little bit with my own story. And I know you can look at my CV, but this is a little more pictorial and historical representation, starting with my childhood and high school in Columbia, Missouri, which as a scientific advisory committee member, Columbia, Missouri um, is, a, is a hot spot <laughs> since there's several of us from there. But here's a few photos. And I went to um, a high school, Hickman High School, that had a Cupid doll as its mascot. Um, then I proceeded to Trinity University, um, a great place to do undergraduate research and study chemistry, also my first time in Texas. And I mentioned this because there's also Trinity is part of the Beckman family. And I know some of you here, are scholars and mentors are from Trinity University. Um, now, I want to say that's really where I started my career in chemistry. So the chemistry club at Trinity University research, and here you can see this National Chemistry Week um, photo of me making a cake um, for chemistry week. And of course, that just happens to match that other photo I showed of me as a child when I was making and creating and building already. My first ACS meeting was in New Orleans. Um, and then, of course, I continue in my current independent career as a faculty member doing a lot of outreach. So really, undergraduates is a time when you start thinking about what you are going to do and how that inspiration strikes you. Um, now, getting into some of the additional details, at Trinity is where I started chemistry, doing undergraduate research, actually initially in some biochemistry field and then in catalysis. Um, I went and uh, pursued my PhD in organic chemistry at UC Irvine. I include a personal photo here. That's where I met my now husband. Um, and then I started a postdoc, and that postdoc uh, was an NIH-funded postdoc. Um, at Harvard University and then also at the Broad Institute. Here, my uh, personal photo includes my um, canine collaborators and consultants, um, my two dogs at the time. <clears throat> now, of course, this photo would not be complete without showing my mentors and advisors, um, very key individuals in my academic training, Professor Michael Doyle at Trinity University, Professor Keith Warple at UC Irvine, and Professor Stuart Schreiber at Harvard University. Um, and so just to, to wrap up before I come back to the mentoring, so now I have my faculty career at UC Davis in the Department of Chemistry. I love my job as a faculty member in the fabulous research group. I get to pursue new ideas. Um, this is an older photo of my daughter, but I, I have a family and you get to balance the joy of like an outing with your daughter and then later on submitting, you know, two publications <laughs> in, in the wee hours of the morning. 
Um, so being a faculty for me has just been been a really, uh, I think, great opportunity. And uh, along with that comes all the professional activity, service, and outreach. I've included pictorially some of the things here. I am very passionate about focusing on um, aspects of equity, STEM for girls, empowering women of organic chemistry, and also racial equity and education equity. Um, and I want to, I'll come back to that briefly later, but just showing that where you are involved in professional activities, service, and outreach is also really coupled with the passion that you have as a faculty member, but also the networking and mentoring that you continue to get and continue to give. All right, so now a little bit more about my postdoc and some advice for building your mentoring team and also being a mentor. So after completing my PhD in a more traditional organic chemistry field, I was excited about pursuing a postdoc. And my postdoc, as I mentioned, was at Harvard University. And at the time, of course, I didn't realize that the Broad Institute would be formed, but I also ended up having a slightly longer postdoc and taking advantage of the opportunity to be first at Harvard University and then continue with um, research that involved chemical biology and screening of small molecules at the Broad Institute. I had several collaborators. I got to be involved with the synthesis as well as the biological testing. And for me, that provided a great training opportunity, as well as writing my own NIH postdoctoral fellowship and then contributing to writing various fellowships, working with Stuart Schreiber as my advisor. Um, and so I think it's really important when you think about picking a postdoc, because when you go to graduate school, sometimes you're picking a lot more based on the school. Um, as a postdoc, you're really applying to a single individual, and you want that person to be able to shape your career. And in fact, if you think about some of the advice out there, it's actually said that a good mentor can ignite your career potential. And so I love this quote, although there's, I'll show you one caveat of things that I want to like expand on briefly later, but a good mentor can indeed dramatically affect the trajectory. Um, and so it is important to think about finding the right person, especially if it's someone like a postdoc advisor. But all along, you want to be open to building multiple interactions and networks because there are many people that you can learn from. So briefly, you can think about essential qualities of a good mentor, and this can be a postdoc advisor, undergraduate advisor, or you, if you're a mentor already, might think about these types of essential qualities that hopefully you exhibit. Enthusiasm, expertise, humility, focus, and emotional intelligence. Um, and these are from um, aspects of, of some, some websites, but it's, it's summarized in a variety of sources. Now, there is a resource called Entering Mentoring that I think also um, capitalizes specifically not on just those qualities, but the behaviors that are most effective. And I think when you're picking, you might think about this as a checklist, but you might also think about some of them as being more critical than others, depending on what you feel you want or need for your career trajectory. So, of course, it's clear to um, importantly align expectations have a good understanding, have that person be able to assess and understand, um, communicate effectively. I am a huge fan of important communication, being able to communicate both strengths and weaknesses and have your mentors help support and build your um, potential. It's really important, I think, that a, a mentor and advisor will address equity and inclusion issues, be aware of these and mentor according to what is needed for individuals and taking into account kind of the systemic issues that exist in our society and also a lot of institutions. Obviously, a good behavior um, is to foster independence because this is putting you onto that um, pathway. And then to think about, of course, promoting professional development. So um, when I thought about it, my advice for picking a postdoc advisor, this is reflecting on my situation, but it's also the advice I've given to my students and those that I have supported in finding their postdoc position. So first, I want to just indicate that I consulted with my uh, graduate research advisor, and I also consulted with another uh, mentor at my institution, UC Irvine at the time, and that was Professor Larry Overman. I think it can be valuable to get different advice or get advice from more than one person. I found that while there was complementary advice, um, both Keith and Larry had slightly different perspectives based on their networks and their um, kind of uh, where they were in their career. So first, of course, the advice is to consult with current mentors and advisors when you think about who is going to be a good postdoc for you based on science and based on mentoring potential. Of course, the reality is you have to consider geographic preferences as well as personal family reasons. 
You want to consider holistic training. And by that, I mean, don't just think about technical skills and science. Think about people skills and grant writing, for example, the ability to help you as an independent science generating your ideas. Um, it's generally very important not to like send out 20 applications. It's very different than applying to graduate school. You do want to selectively focus on one application and one person that you might be most excited about. Um, you know, it's also you do not need to have a position posted, unlike an industry job where you might apply to a specific one. Generally, you can send unsolicited applications to postdoc advisors. Uh, I think it's really important to try to meet a potential advisor before you apply. And ideally, if you can talk to their students or their postdocs, that can be helpful. And of course, be proactive. I'll touch back on that a little bit more. Um, now, I want to use the last few minutes of my time just to talk a little bit about mentoring resources. There's a lot of mentoring resources out there. And there's a little bit of a myth I want to make sure to dispel today because I think it's really important when you're thinking about picking a postdoc advisor or being a mentor and advisor. There's this myth of the one super amazing mentor who taught or teaches you everything. Um, and the reality is you can have some amazing mentors, but that's a lot of pressure for one person, um, whether you're the mentor or you're the mentee trying to receive that mentoring and advice. So if I go back to this slide, I had, of course, my three uh, wonderful mentors, Mike Doyle, Keith Warple, and Stuart Schreiber. Um, but if you'll notice, they are white men. I am not a white man. <laughs> it's helpful to think about how you have a team of mentors that can enhance the mentoring and advising you receive. So no matter who your mentor or advisor is, think about bringing in additional mentoring that supports you. So the National Center for Faculty Diversity and Development really talks about the importance of a mentoring team. And I want to mention that now only because when you're picking a postdoc advisor, it's important to also think about the institution and the mentoring that you will receive outside of that one individual and complement that mentoring. Um, so really, you want to think in general, what do you need and what is the most strategic way to get it? All right. And actually, there is then a, a better way for me to show this slide. So my mentors and advisors, of course, I have my my more formal research mentors and advisors. Uh, but if we quickly go through it, I have a lot of a wonderful faculty that uh, were present when I was in a, when I was an undergrad at Trinity University. And in this case, um, both Nancy Mills and Michelle Bushy featured at the top there were not only mentors, but also role models and inspiration. And I actually interact with them uh, professionally today through the Division of Organic Chemistry at ACS and also NSF. So those also are great networks that you're making at a very early stage. Um, during my uh, graduate work, I met, I, I worked and um, kind of collaborated, our groups collaborated and had group meetings with Larry Overman's group. And I also had the chance to meet um, folks visiting for sabbatical like Professor Scott Sieber. Um, so at UC Davis, I found it really important to think about mentoring and advice, not just within the chemistry department, but outside. Um, and this is where I've also been able to seek out more diverse mentors who have been very supportive of me, and I also collaborate and appreciate working with them. So here we have Susan Kozlerich and also um, Renetta Toll, who's the Vice Chancellor of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at UC Davis, one of my valued coworkers and a program director at UC Davis, Lolita Atkins, and uh, Marco Molinaro, who is an assistant, or excuse me, yeah, assistant vice um, provost for undergraduate education. And so I think it's important to think, you know, not just within chemistry, but also mentors outside. Now, um, there's also a great number of mentors professionally that I've met at conference or served on committees and foundations. Um, and also many of several of you here today fall under that category. Um, so I think it's important to think not just, you know, the people that you see every week or every month, but maybe you only see them every year. They can be valuable for your mentoring team. Finally, I include um, my mom and my my partner, my, my, my husband. My mom was actually um, at, at, uh, up to um, an associate dean and interim provost at University of Missouri Columbia. So she's been a great academic mentor as well and just gives that great mom type advice as well. Um, and then my own partner is also a professor of chemistry. So you should look everywhere for thinking about that. And in fact, the science of mentoring supports this. So there's multiple models for mentoring, and this is from a great um, science of effective mentorship report that the National Academies put out. Um, and so traditionally, the dyad is where you think of that, you know, one-to-one -one mentor mentee relationship. But if you look down at this network, that's what I'm trying to advocate for today: having a, a mentor 
team or network where your graduate advisor, your undergraduate advisor, and your postdoc advisor is part of that. Um, and so it turns out then that if you think about what do you need and what is the most strategic and efficient way to get it, there's going to be you at the center and all of these uh, pieces around that. And your postdoc advisor is one of those pieces, but probably not going to be all of them. So you want to think about for this list, can they fulfill as many of those, but recognizing that they won't fulfill all of them and how you have a team that complements that with your professional network, mentors from your previous um, institutions, your current institution and other areas. So for this mentoring map, you can think about who's going to be the one to give you feedback, like editing, who's going to be a sponsor, who's going to support professional development, who's going to give you access to opportunities, who's going to give you emotional support an intellectual support or intellectual community, who's going to be a role model, who might provide that safe space for you when you need it, and who's going to be accountable for what really matters. I think no one person can do all of that. And so that is why having a mentoring team and really thinking in that mindset can be really valuable. Um, and so if we think about it that way, I do also want to state that it can be really important as a mentee to do what's called mentoring up. And that's a little bit of being proactive and taking on the approach of how can you take some responsibility. And so if you think about it, starting from when you are going to um, look for a postdoc, you are mentoring up, you are finding the mentor that meets your needs, both uh, scientifically, intellectually, hopefully to a certain extent, emotionally, and in terms of advocacy and support, diversity, inclusion. Um, but if not one person does all of that, that's okay, because you're going to be proactive about creating your mentoring team. All right, so obviously this is a huge topic. I'm going to try to give this brief concluding advice, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. First, most important advice is to be proactive. So I didn't go into all the details, but when I was looking for my postdoc, I what you know proactivity is is required. You have to submit um, an application similar to what we heard um, previously to some of Jeff's talks. You have to have a CV and a, um, a research summary. You have to be proactive to submit that. You have to be proactive about getting that position. Um, I also um, was able to be proactive about arranging to meet with members of the Schreiber Lab and meeting with Stuart Schreiber for an informal interview before having the, the opportunity to be offered a position. Um, you really also just in general want to be proactive about presenting your research, applying for fellowships, knowing what fellowships you're eligible for, eligible for and pursuing that. Um, in general, you will want to be proactive in finding additional mentors, being a mentor now and in the future. Even as an undergraduate student, you can already take on a mentoring role. And of course, also being proactive and thinking about how you serve your community, both scientifically and personally. So of course, as I've stated, building a mentoring team is critical. So that is something I really want to recommend. And think about the key aspect of how you can um, bring in multiple people as role models that support you as an individual in the most strategic way possible. Um, in addition to mentoring up, as I briefly mentioned, think about developing a mentor action plan. So once you do have a postdoc advisor and also um, other mentors, think about what you need and how to hold yourself accountable and how to have that partnership or agreement so that you're working together with your mentor to accomplish the actions that best serve you. All right, with that, this I have a slightly different acknowledgement than usual because um, while I want to, of course, um, thank the Beckman Foundation for their support of mentorship and for the opportunity to speak with you today, um, I want this acknowledgement to not necessarily just be my formal mentors, but really a lot of those informal mentors and advisors. Those, those are the ones that you've learned so much from or you get really key advice at strategic times. So recognizing the, the time when maybe you were at a conference or a committee meeting um, in a class, a hallway, or a Zoom networking room, and you got some great advice at just the right time. Um, so I want to acknowledge and thank all of the people that have done that for me through my career, and I hope I'm passing it forward, and I hope that everyone here as mentees and mentors um, will also realize that mentoring and the mentoring team is a very critical um, concept, 
and you can contribute to someone's mentoring team in the smallest ways possible. So just to be open and appreciative of your role and the role that you can receive as a mentor and a mentee. All right, well, thank you very much. I'm excited to hand it over to Kent for his talk as well. And thank you, Annalise, for that great presentation. I do want to now present today's second speaker, Kent Hill, Professor of Microbiology and Immunology of Molecular Genetics. And Ken will focus on part two of this presentation, choosing your path by navigating the road from PhD studies to the next step. And following Ken's presentation, we will have that Q&A portion of the webinar. So feel free to start writing in your questions during the presentation. Ken, welcome. You may now begin your presentation, sir. Okay, well, thank you, first of all, to Kerry and all of the Beckman team and the Lab Roots teams for putting this symposium together. I'm really, really happy to be part of this uh, discussion. And I just kind of want to thank the earlier presenters for presenting really, really informative discussions about aspects of, of choosing and navigating your career path. And I think it's important to remember through all of these discussions that this process is really an active one. And it depends on your effort, and you're you're the main player. So, as Annalisa just mentioned, you're going to identify mentors and use them and, and seek them out. You'll also learn a lot from your students and your trainees. And a key thing to remember is that you're in control, and you want to make sure that you're always having an eye out for what is working right for you and um, what you want to try to do next. So. I've had a number of affiliations with the Beckman Foundation, and I'm really happy to be part of this discussion. And we had a nice discussion uh, from Annalise about mentoring and choosing mentors that are that will play an important role in your uh, career path decisions. I'm going to focus my discussion a little bit more on what it was from my perspective as the, the person making these choices and, and moving forward. And I'll start with talking a little bit about what I do now, just because that provides a foundation to understand what I did to get here and how I came about coming to this position. And then the majority of the presentation will be about how I got here. So we'll focus on key transition points, sort of decision points, and then a little bit of emphasis on what the factors were that helped inform my decision and, and caused me to choose one thing or another. So what do I do now? Right now, I'm a professor of microbiology, immunology, and molecular genetics at UCLA, and my laboratory studies the flagellum or cilium of an African trypanosome. And this is a picture of an African trypanosome, a scanning electron micrograph of an African trypanosome in blue, and in gold is the flagellum or the cilium, and that's the focus of our studies. And I, I study this from the standpoint of infectious disease because this is a pathogen. We also learn things about cilium biology that are relevant for human diseases called ciliopathies. And I do it because I really, really like fundamental biology. And we use a number of different approaches and different techniques to study this, this organism, the questions we are interested in. And all of these are things that I picked up along the path of choosing and navigating my career path. Why I do what I do is because these organisms, um, our cilia in general, are important for global public health. They're uh, organelles that function in a variety of, of infectious pathogens that cause a number of diseases, a number of infectious diseases in humans. And cilia and flagella are also important for the development and physiology of humans. And so the importance of this is to human health as well as fundamental biology. And our main questions are really asking about how the parasites move through their different environments and how they sense their environments. These parasites cause diseases in humans and they cause diseases in uh, economically important livestock. And to do this, they need to move and they need to know where they are. And so we ask questions about how do they sense to know where they are and how do they move to get to where they're going? And that's sort of a little bit like what we're gonna talk about or what you're talking about here in this symposium session, which is it's really important to know where you are, know where you're going, and know how to get there. And I think one important thing to come from this is that that path is going to be individual for each of you. So 
in terms of the other things I do besides research, this is another, you know, I chose an academic path to do academic postdoc after graduate school and, and then start my own research laboratory. And some of the things I do beyond research, of course, is I advise and mentor trainees. And part of that advisement is helping them understand what their projects are, thinking of projects, writing papers, grant proposals, and presentations. And I also work to promote and advertise for my students and trainees through seminars and presentations, through discussions with colleagues, and of course, through reference letters. And beyond that, of course, there's teaching to undergraduate and graduate students, committee service, both the department that I'm in, the university more broadly, to the research community and to my local community. And then lastly, as with any profession, you've also got a component of that that is personal time that you have for hobbies, friends and family, et cetera. And that all gets worked into a, a whole package that becomes your career and your job. So here's my, you know, sort of typical career path, right, that, that I would show people. So I start, I didn't start quite at, uh, at the age that Annalisa did, but as an undergraduate, I did undergraduate training at Northern Illinois University, and I got a degree in biology and a second one in chemistry. And then from there, I went to graduate school at UCLA, where I worked in the biochemistry and cell biology of this organism shown here in the top, Clematomonas reinhardii. And from there, I went to a postdoc at University of Iowa, where I started to do a little more cell biology, first in the yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and then in the parasite Trypanosoma brucei. And from there, I decided to go on and take a faculty position, and that's how I, I ended up getting to UCLA, uh, where I work on parasite cell biology and pathogenesis. And we'll talk about each of these steps uh, in order next. But what I wanted to point out really was that, well, that slide shows this nice linear path, and it sounds like everything um, just fell into place, your career path is not necessarily always that linear. And I thought maybe a nice metaphor of this would be this video of me uh, inner tubing. This was just a few weeks ago in Wisconsin, and I'm going to try to play the video. I, I hope it plays and the sound plays, and I'll, I'll narrate as it goes along. And I think this is a bit of a metaphor for planning your career path and, and charting your career path. So that's really a main theme I want to have you guys take home today is that you're the one in charge of your career path. And there's lots of important things to do. And one of the most important is to remember that you, you're you taking charge and, and you control where you're going. So my first step after undergrad was going to graduate school uh, at UCLA. And here again, I show this nice line. But in reality, the path was not quite so linear. Oops. Let's see here. I think I forgot to, okay. Okay, we should be on a slide now. Uh, hopefully somebody can tell me this is okay. My path from uh, undergraduate to graduate school. And as an undergrad at NIU, I learned about biology and chemistry. I really enjoyed what I did and I learned a lot of science and I thought I wanted to go to graduate school. But as I neared the end of graduation, I realized I wasn't sure if that's really what I wanted to do. I, I wanted to figure out where I really was headed. I was making decent money at the time, and so I went ahead and after graduation, I continued working for Atlas Van Lines as a mover, or as I sometimes put on my CV or resume, as a relocation engineer. And that was great. I, I made a lot of money. I made a lot of friends. It was very invigorating. But of course, it's a very physical activity as well. And after about a year of doing that, I and one or two knee surgeries, I decided that maybe it was time to try to put that degree to use. And I wanted to, again, ask whether or not, you know, going into science and as a profession was what I really wanted to do. And so I took a job at Abbott Laboratories, and that's where I worked uh, in protein purification and development of, that, of diagnostics for cancer and a number of other diseases. And this was really a formative time for me. It was a full two years, and I spent that time learning, 
uh, getting to know the process of putting all these things that I learned in school to use and really deciding that I liked this. I, I liked doing science as a career. I also realized in that environment that I wanted to be part of the decision making team. Right. So I didn't want to just follow instructions and, and do the things that I was told. I wanted to be part of the team that was deciding what should be done and how to do it. So for that, I realized I really did need to go to graduate school and I really did want to go to graduate school. And so I went from there to look for a graduate degree uh, program. And as some many of you have done undergraduates are doing this now. And I ended up at the uh, University of California where I got a Ph.D. in biochemistry, molecular genetics. Uh, uh, with Sabiha Merchant, and I won't talk about the, the mentors here. Annalisa has mentioned how important that that is. And while I was here in graduate school, I learned how to be a scientist. I learned how to think about science, how to develop problems uh, and questions for problems and how to go after them. And when I finished that, I realized that, you know, this really is something I still like to do. I'm going to move on to the next step to a postdoc. Okay. And then again, here's my linear chart that shows that just simply transitioned into a postdoc at the University of Iowa. But in fact, of course, it was quite a, there was quite a bit involved there. First of all, I had to decide whether or not I wanted to do an academic postdoc or some other type of postdoc. And each of these things are possible. These are just this listing in bullets is just a short list of the things you guys, you folks can think about in going on from graduate school. You can go to an industry setting, go to a national laboratory, you can go to patent law, you can go to teaching, you can go to journalism, as well as an academic postdoc. And I've had graduate students from my laboratory go on to each of these different areas and, and be successful and happy. For me, I chose an academic postdoc. And what were the key factors in deciding this? Well, one, I, I really liked independence. And again, I liked the idea of an open road ahead where I could choose what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it. I also felt that the experience in graduate school led me to understand that there was a lot more that I would like to learn and understand. And I thought doing an academic postdoc was, was a great way to do that. I had also had an experience in industry. And as I said, I worked for two years for Abbott Laboratories. And so I knew what that setting was like. And those are some of the things that helped me decide to take the academic postdoc route. But again, each of these other routes is, is very um, fun and exciting and uh, productive. And I've had a number of graduate students go to each of these different areas. So after I decided for I wanted to do an academic postdoc, I then, of course, had to decide where and with whom. And as Annalisa already mentioned, the choice of, you know, with whom you'll do your studies and where are really important. And those are important because it's, it's critical to develop, to move into a place that's got a really good training environment. And you should remember as well that the training environment you're looking for as a postdoc is you're going to be looking for different things than those that you look for as a graduate student. Right, a graduate student, you look for a place to learn how to be a scientist, you know, think about science, identify problems, develop ways to go after the questions that are important for those problems. The training environment that you're looking for for a postdoc is a bit different. The mentor is really important. This is a person that's going to have to um, support your development of independence as well as training. And you're going to also have to take things more on on your own because you don't have a, a graduate program that you're part of. Another important factor, of course, is the field of study. As a graduate student, the field of study should be of interest to you and exciting. It doesn't necessarily have to be what you're going to do. For a postdoc, you're getting close to maybe to the area that you're going to end up in. So you want to think about that field of study a bit more. And importantly, you've got to have very good growth potential in this in the area that you're going to move into because you're hoping to develop something you can build and, and develop into your own program. And of course, uh, choosing the mentor is really, really important. It's got to be someone who is able to support and encourage your development as an individual and uh, promote you as an independent scientist when you move on. So for me, I chose John Donaldson at the University of Iowa, and that's where I learned about trypanosome cell biology and pathogenesis. And here's some of the key factors that went into me making my decision. Um, first of all is that I felt the organism that was the topic of study was different and fascinating. So it was a little bit different than a lot of the organisms that I had worked with in the past and a, quite a bit different than many of the organisms that I saw people talk about. There was medical relevance. This is a pathogen that I was going to work with and that meant that that's one area for funding that doesn't have to be the case for all 
all uh, successful uh, fields of study, of course, but that was one of the things that um, factored into my decision. And it also, for me, it was important when I was going to a postdoc that the, the field I was going into um, really was well-placed for really making um, innovative discoveries. And so there must be a strong foundation of understanding for the organism, so a foundation of the understanding of the cell biology and the molecular biology of these organisms. And that was clear for trypanosomes. A big factor for me as well was that new tools at the time were becoming available to study these organisms. So these are in pathogens that have been studied for some time. They had some really fascinating cell biology and molecular biology that had been done, but the ability to manipulate them had not been there. And for me, at the time that I was looking for a postdoc, the fact that you could now culture these organisms in vitro, there were new tools becoming available to manipulate them genetically, a lot of selectable markers and reporters. And so you could do all the sorts of uh, um, Manip genetic manipulation experiments that you might think about for sort of more classic or standard organisms. These again are the factors that were important for me. They made a, a big, had a big influence on how I chose the lab where I was going to do my postdoc and, and what the topic of that uh, postdoc was going to be. For each individual, this may be a little bit different. And if, of course, you choose an industry setting or a national lab or teaching or journalism, that you know, step after your, your graduate work, the decision and the factors will be a bit different. But what's important is that you think about it as what is it that you want? Where is it that you are going? Where are you? Where do you want to go and how do you get there? Okay, so then I, I find myself at a faculty position, and again, the nice linear chart just shows I did a postdoc at the University of Iowa, I learned all I needed to do, and I went out and I got a faculty position. Well, in fact, of course, you know, the, the process a little, is a little more involved than that. First of all, again, you have to make a decision. Am I going to take a faculty position in an academic setting or some other uh, type of position in industry, for example, and if you do a faculty position where you could go on to another another area such as journalism. For me, I really considered industry and uh, an academic setting, uh, and in fact, uh, was offered a job at Serono uh, about their company in Geneva, Switzerland. It was very enticing, and as well as uh, looking for faculty positions both uh, abroad and here in the States, and ultimately I chose UCLA. How did I end up choosing that particular, uh, why did I end up choosing a faculty position? And again, for me, the key factors were that I really liked what I was doing as a postdoc. I enjoyed the process. I really enjoyed mentoring. I enjoyed working with younger scientists and, and helping them and, and learning with them and learning from them. And so I decided that I'd try the academic a bit more. And again, I came from the standpoint of having done some time in industry, so I knew what that road looked like. Then I have to choose a lab or choose a faculty uh, job rather. And again, here, there are a number of different things to consider, but strong environment. Can you get the work that you want done? Can you get it done there? You know, both with resources and, and money. And do you have a supportive uh, community and collaborative community? And there's a bit, somebody else mentioned, I think it was Jeff, that there's a bit of luck involved right? You've got to get the job offer. So there's a few different places I interviewed, maybe had a couple of different offers, but it, it kind of depends on getting that offer. And for me as well, at the time, I had a significant other. So for some of you, that may be a factor. And I will encourage you that um, no matter where you are and what you're trying to do, if you're patient and thoughtful about it, and again, take the reins, there's ways to make almost anything work. And so that puts me to where I am now at UCLA, a professor of MIMG. And I guess if I had to sum up my approach to this career path, it's a little bit of groundhog approach. And that is that at some point you decide where you want to go. You decide on a direction. Then you put your head down and you work on getting there. But every once in a while, it's really important to pop up and ask yourself two questions. One, am I still headed in the direction that I started off in? And two, is to ask yourself if that's still the direction you want to be going in. And I think if you use those two guiding questions, you know, to help guide you as you navigate your career path, you'll end up and, and then remember that it's your path and your decisions are involved. I think you'll you'll make great decisions. And to summarize, then choosing your path, it's an active process. You've got to take control. You always have choices. Again, you are in charge. It's not always a straight line. And even though it may get choppy at some time, just hang on check out the places outside your comfort zone and always evaluate where you're at 
and you should be enjoying it. There's difficulties here and there, but you should be enjoying it. And if not, then think about whether there's a different um, different uh, a turn on your path you might want to take. So with that, I will close, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Kent, for that informative presentation. And I want to welcome back Annalisa to begin our live Q&A portion of the webinar with both of you. And our audience members, if you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located at the bottom right of your screen. And we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So welcome back, Annalisa. It looks like we have some great questions already coming in, and I'm just going to ask these questions, and I'll let either one of you take it, or you can even say, jump in and say, I'd also like to ask, answer that question, okay? So our first question from our audience is, will an interview usually include the PI and lab members, or only the PI? And the second part of that is, if the former, what sort of questions should lab members be asked? Are there any questions you wish you would have asked? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll answer it, and I'm sure Kent will also want to chime in. Um, yeah, I think one thing that's really key um, when you are applying for a postdoc, you should assume that you will either have a Zoom interview or, or an in-person interview. And part of the point of that is not just to give a research seminar about your graduate research, but also to meet the lab members and partly make sure that um, basically that you're going to be a good lab citizen and that just, you know, you're not going to get admitted just because you have good science. You also want to contribute to the team and be someone that the current lab members will want to work next to. So you should expect that you will interview with the PI one-on-one -on -one, and that you will interview or meet with the lab members. And it might not seem like an interview. It might be like, oh, hey, they're going to take you out to lunch. But as many postdocs in the audience might recall, um, that is actually a key time to ask questions, but also be, um, be able to give information about yourself that makes you seem like a good candidate um, for the lab and being a good lab citizen and teammate. Um, so I think the question you said was, what sort of questions um, should lab members be asked? This is where you can ask them about the mentoring of that they receive from the PI. Like, what type of mentoring, and do they feel that that mentoring provides what they need? Um, and is the rest of the lab or the environment where the postdoc is taking place also providing good mentoring, advocacy, support, and aspects like that? Um, I think I remember asking a lot of questions. That was a little while ago, um, but I do think it's just a great chance to ask about, um, you know, how how focused, how productive, and how enriched you feel, so that you're getting both scientific training, but also kind of more holistic training for professional success. So, Kent, um, go ahead. I'd love to hear your your thoughts too. I think I would second everything that Annalisa said. I don't know that I have to add. Definitely, you will meet with the PI and the lab members. And as Annalisa said, that's really a chance both for them to get to know you a bit and you to get to know them. And it goes beyond just the academics, right? And it's and it's an important part of it. These are people you're going to work with, you know, day in day out for a long time. You also will likely meet with other faculty, right? So when I have a postdoc candidate come, I definitely set up to have them meet with other faculty that are of relevance to because. As a postdoc, you're going to interface not just with your lab and, and the people in it, but the people around you, and that's really important. So you, you may meet with other faculty or even uh, lab members from other groups that might be collaborating or working along the same lines as the, the group that you're interviewing with. Yeah, I want to I want to add one thing to that. Um, I remember going into it initially thinking like, oh my God, it's going to be my my qualifying exam, and they're going to ask me all these tough science questions. But a lot of the questions that I was asked had to do more with big picture mm -hmm. ideas, collaboration style. So it is really important to shift the type of questions is really more um, collaboration and future types of opportunities, not just do you know the PKA or the or the cell size or the, the specific methods. So just to think about it really in terms of broadening um, the types of questions and the potential of how you can share your enthusiasm. Great point. Our next question is something I remember actually asking in grad school. Is a postdoc position considered a job 
or education or both? And if someone's interested in a postdoc position, how proper is it to ask about previous postdocs? I, I can start that. So uh, one, yes, absolutely. It's it's well, I, or, uh, it's a job and a edu and education. Right? I, I think any job ultimately is education. Um, but in fact, when you look uh, at someone's CV, it's often when they record trainees. Postdocs are under trainees, so a yeah. post is definitely an educational process. Um, sometimes they may even be called students. Um, so it's 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 a bit of both, definitely. And the second part was, oh, how, oh, you should absolutely ask where former postdocs are now, right? You, you want to know for the lab you're considering, how well do they do at placing people once they finish their postdoc into the next spot? And again, that can be a number of different very, um, effective positions. It could be a faculty position, it could be a lab and industry, it could be a managed position, but certainly you want to know that the place you're considering has a good track record of putting people into, you know, appropriate jobs afterward. Um, and, and again, that's something to talk with the students that you meet with about. Some of them may be in the lab where you're interviewing, they may be thinking about finishing soon and starting the process of you know, postdocs there that are starting the process of, of looking for the next job. Yeah, great. I'll briefly add to that. Um, through the power of LinkedIn and <laughs> Google searches, you can also look up some of these details. Um, yes. But asking is really important because it's not just about where they are, but the experience they might have had, number of publications, ability to go and present at conferences, have time to write graduate applications, be supported for fellowships, um, those are all really important questions that you can ask. And that's why it is essentially, I say, you know, you're getting paid a little more than a grad student, but not as much as if you had a full job, especially in industry. So you think of it more as training or education because you should not just be in lab working for the, uh, the, your new advisor, but really receiving knowledge and benefit about the experience. Um, and then I think I would also mention it can be really key to think about, um, how you are then, of course, being proactive um, to take advantage of that at the same time. And in addition to asking the lab members for the PI you're considering, you can ask lab members in adjacent groups sometimes to see if you hear the same story. Um, that mm -hmm. can also be beneficial. Yeah. One other, another good question to ask or thing to be thinking about is not just where have former postdocs gone, but for the folks that are there and, and working, what is it like when you one, try to do something a little more off the main path of that lab. And two, what is the mentor like with respect to supporting uh, people to take their own projects when they go? You know, that that's something you usually navigate near the end of your postdoc, but it's something that you can address, you know, when you interview. You know, is, is this a person that is, is welcoming, you know, people taking things that they develop to, to move on? Thank you both so much. This is such important and valuable dialogue, and we have some great questions coming in from our audience. Do you recommend working before going to graduate school? Was it jarring to go back after several years off from school? Good question. Or maybe that's maybe that's directed at me. Um, <laughs> you, I, do what is right for you. Um, I think people go sometimes directly from undergrad to graduate school, and it's great. Um, and sometimes it's not. People first go to work somewhere else and then go back to graduate school like I did. And it was great. That was exactly right for me. It helped me because when it comes to these decision steps, again, I had this experience with industry. It was really good. I enjoyed it. I, I could have seen myself in industry, you know, but it helped me to understand one, what that path, part, that path would look like. And two, it helped me understand, yeah, this is really what I want to do. I want to be in graduate school. So I think it's more about the individual and um, whether it's right for you. Again, when I finished undergrad, I was a little bit uncertain about if graduate school was the path for me. So having time off was, was an important in, in cementing the idea that it was. Um, I think it may depend a bit too on what's available, uh, you know, Applications to graduate school are really, really competitive. We have a number of students 
uh, uh, applying uh, that are great, but we don't have room for. So you might have to take a job somewhere while you're still in the process of finding that right graduate school position. Yeah. Um, I'll jump in. And um, I think since there are a lot of our audience are Beckman scholars, uh, Kent, I would say I'm sure most of our Beckman scholars are quite competitive and you will more likely be having a tough time deciding which school to go to mm -hmm. once you apply. Mm -hmm. um, I, I then went straight to graduate school from undergrad. And part of that was because I did have, uh, was in a, I guess, a privileged uh, space. My parents were professors, so I was privileged in having, thinking and seeing um, what it meant to go on to a PhD program. And for me, that it wasn't necessarily expected, but I knew it was a good option. And honestly, I think it's a little less scary to keep staying in school than to find a job. So applying to schools, um, having several to choose from, was actually exciting. You'll go and you'll travel around as some of you have done to visit graduate programs and, and pick one that has research and people you're excited to work with. And so I think for me, it was definitely a great option to just go straight to graduate school. However, um, I did notice that those who had come from industry and had been working in industry for several years did have some additional experience and perspective that I didn't have. But that I think still was inspiring to me. And I was glad to have them as um, students in the program, but I did at times feel like I had to work a little extra um, because of that. Um, but I, I think when I advise students now, um, you can apply to graduate school and then decide. You don't have to, um, you know, make that decision and not change your mind. You can apply, visit schools, and then see if that's right or if at that point in time you want to go um, into industry for a year or two. Right, and there are bachelorette, pro, post bachelorette programs at the NIH, for example, and other other opportunities. If you're thinking about it, I think there was a question about whether it was jarring. I don't know that it was jarring, but you know, there may be an added perspective and wisdom having come from the the industry realm. But it also meant that you know I had to ramp up my studying skills mm -hmm. uh, again in a way that I wouldn't have if I had gone directly from undergrad. Very true. Our next question. For someone who has also planned to study pathology, what do you think the largest deciding factor is when choosing graduate or med medical school post undergrad? Mm. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, maybe Annalisa can comment. I think the the graduate school versus medical school is a big one that a lot of people come up on. Um, I, I again, for my students that have gone through that, I make it individual. Usually, they they sort the often sort that out a bit, you know, in the last year or two of, of undergraduate. Um, yeah, I think either path for pathology would be great. Um, I think in the end, it depends a bit on w whether you want to prioritize, you know, time with patients and clinical effort, you know, which is definitely something you'll have with medical school or an MD, PhD, but not so much with PhD. Um, on the other hand, if you do a PhD in a lab that collaborates with, you know, clinical scientists, you will have that opportunity. So hmm, that's that. That's a little more individual. I don't know if I'm having not done the medical school route. I'm not not sure if I'm best positioned to answer that. Um, I don't know if Annalisa has a a thought on that one. Yeah, I'll just say I've mentored several students who have gone to medical school and also MD, PhD programs in addition to graduate school. And I think it, well, part of it depends on whether you see yourself um, doing research and clinical research impacting medicine versus seeing patients. Now, of course, you can see patients um, while still doing some clinical research. Um, but a lot of the um, exciting opportunities do come from the research side. So you might then think about either the PhD or the MD. Um, as, as the option to consider. And this is a great chance for informational interviews. Interview, yeah. especially using the Beckman Family Network. Um, interview folks and just from, a, from an informational standpoint, ask them about their experience, how they decided. Because as Ken said, neither of us went to medical school, um, but the Beckman Foundation, um, you know, we have a lot of people who have done that route and would be more than happy, I'm sure, to share their experience. Yeah, that's, that's a great suggestion. And similarly to that question, this can, is a good follow-up. Have you had any students go to medical school after completing their PhD, and how is their path similar to the variety of postdoc opportunities? Um, I've, I've had a few students go to go to medical school, um, both MD and MD-PhD. 
Um, and I think the medical school route is fairly defined. Um, you know, when you finish your medical training, then you you typically go through residency. And uh, to my understanding, that's that's you know every bit as many options as as postdoc. You know, is in terms of identifying what you want to do next, um, because you you identify maybe where you want to train, maybe a little bit about what area. Although that I think you learn more when you get to medical school. Um, and then you again put your head down and work hard. But identifying residencies after after med school is is um, a big process. There, in addition to residencies, I've had um, a student or two take on direct research residency. They went to MD PhD, um, one person at UNC, and then entered a program that's designed for research clinicians uh, that's ongoing at Stanford. Uh, so there, there definitely are a, a large number of choices following medical school in, in terms of what you want to do. I think the path, because it's more of a, um, it's a little more prescribed in terms of the the way that you go about it, because it's it's medicine and you need licensure and things like that. But there's off, often still the a large number of choices that you'll have presented to you. Thank you both so much. We have time for one more question. This is fantastic. When is it appropriate? At what point of the process? And if, what should you do to try to negotiate for when you are in a position of multiple offers for research autonomy, research funding, salary benefits, moving expenses? Would those be something that someone would try to get if they were in that position of multiple offers? It would be nice to be in that position. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's I, that's an interesting question because um, applying for postdocs, as I mentioned, is a little different than applying to jobs. Applying to jobs, you almost automatically assume you're going to apply to multiple positions and hopefully have multiple offers. As a postdoc, you're really trying to be very strategic about what's best for your uh, mentoring and career trajectory, as well as geographic and personal considerations. Um, and so you're less likely to have multiple postdoc offers that you're trying to negotiate between because really you don't, yeah, I mean, I just, it's, a, it's a mentoring relationship, not um, kind of a, a job. So I do think that that's something just to keep in mind as a calibration point. Um, now, I do say that um, also for things like salary and benefits, most universities have very set postdoc training things that are very specifically related to NIH a salary levels and so you don't negotiate that quite the same because it really is generally very um, consistent based on those levels set by NIH. But what you point out about research autonomy and research funding is really critical and I would say those are not really negotiations, very clear discussions that need to happen about expectations. Are you starting a project that you're going to take with you? Are you working on an existing project? Are you going to be supported and expected to get your own funding? Are you going to work on an existing project and also apply for funding? So you absolutely want to see those, not really as negotiations, but as very clear discussion of the mm -hmm. expectations. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and are you expected to apply for a grant prior to coming? Mm -hmm. And is the position predicated upon you getting funding to come in? You know, typically you'd want to come in with the understanding that there's resources available to support you, and then also that that person and team would be there to help you develop a, a grant application. So and I would say briefly, the other types of expectations are, are you going to teach? You might want to teach. You might not want to teach because of your future career plan. How many conferences you will attend, if conferences will, be, the cost of conferences will be covered. Um, thinking about all of that uh, professional development opportunities and ensuring that that is part of the training that you will receive. Yeah, that's a really good point. The professional development opportunities. <laughs> UCLA. At UCLA, we have... We have programs that um, specifically set postdocs up with teaching opportunities. So that is something to inquire about, particularly if you're interested in, in getting more teaching experience. You know, some graduate programs have teaching as a real strong component of the training. Others do not. So some postdocs come in, you know, fine with what they're doing teaches. Others want some more teaching opportunities. And more and more places, more and more universities will have that available. And you may want to check with your uh, potential a mentor whether or not they support 
those activities out, you know, beyond just the work in their lab. Hi, Lisa. Ken, thank you both for your presentation today. Would you like to provide any closing remarks to our audience before we go? I'll start with you, um, Kent. Uh, I would say maybe what I put in my summary, that's the, your career, navigating your career path is an active process. It doesn't just happen. You have to take the range and take charge. And it's important to, again, in addition to working hard and put your head down, is to continually evaluate if, if you're headed in the way you want to go and, and is that, you know, are you doing the right things to get there? So it's active and you're in charge. Thank you so much. And Alisa? Uh, I'd be happy to follow up with anyone. My dog is also very passionate about this topic. <laughs> and I wanted to convey again to be proactive, to ask questions, and really um, take advantage of the opportunity to create your mentoring team and think about how it's going to set you on a path for success. And before we go, I also want to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. Thank you again, Annalisa and Kent, for your time today. And this webcast is available today and during our event and will be available until next August 2022. We encourage you to share your experience with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye-bye, everyone. See you in the next.